Einen schönen guten Abend. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, evening. Um, I am very delighted uh, to be uh, chairing this event tonight. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for facilitating uh, this event. Thank you so much to Jörg Schulz and uh, to his colleague Charlotte uh, Tintawi. Um, thank you so much for being here, Hamid. Uh, Hamid Dabashi, of course, is the Hagop Kevorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Uh, he is uh, a truly global uh, intellectual, uh, if I may say so. Uh, he has published over 25 books on very various, uh, on, on, on a number of issues, ranging from uh, cinema, uh, the so-called Middle East, uh, but also regional geopolitics, global geopolitics. And you certainly, I mean, uh, are familiar with his works and his regular commentary uh, all over the place. Unfortunately, not so in, I mean, uh, so maybe we need some German translators for your commentary. Um, so um, maybe among those books, uh, what is uh, perhaps significant to say in terms of the discussions tonight, or noteworthy, is his 2007 book, uh, uh, which is titled Iran, a People Interrupted, that I wholeheartedly recommend, which is an amazing uh, tour de force of over 200 years of political and literary history of modern Iran. Um, I hope also there are going to be some German translation of this one as well. So, and um, so that, um, so the, another main reason for inviting him, for inviting Hamid, is that he has acted over the last years, over the last decades, as a truly moral compass. In so many issues, from uh, the struggles in Iran, but also the struggles in the region uh, in, in the context of the Arab uprisings, but also in the struggles in, in Palestine and elsewhere. Uh, but also, uh, he's also m very much involved in uh, the debates in the West. But we're going to devote our attention tonight to both Iran and uh, the tumultuous regional geopolitics. Um, as you all know, there was on uh, uh, July 14th a deal struck between Iran and world powers. Uh, so the nuclear crisis was actually, uh, you know, it seems to be ending after a decade. Um, and uh, so we take this opportunity to think about uh, critical thinking uh, in the wake of the Iran deal. So how, how can we can, uh, you know, um, have a fresh but still critical appraisal of what is going on in this process of rapprochement between Iran and the West. So I'm very delighted that we have Professor Dabashi with us tonight, going to share his insights, and then we're going to go over to a Q&A. The special mise-en-scene uh, <clears throat> of this reminds me of Khomeini in Beis uh, <laughs> Zahra. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, express my absolute gratitude to Ali Fatullah Rajat for facilitating my coming here. And uh, as he was doing his very kind and gracious uh, introduction, uh, I just wanted to sit here and listen to him and don't say anything. There is very little that I can say that he cannot uh, share with you. In certain field of scholarship, when scholars reach a point, like me, white beard, uh, they actually ceremoniously uh, kiss their uh, pen, or in this case, their laptop, uh, and they don't touch it anymore uh, because they are afraid they may say something wrong. And they follow their own students and younger colleagues. And uh, for us to talk about <clears throat> the field of critical thinking about Iran, and particularly this period of rapprochement, so-called, between uh, 5 plus 1 and Iran. Uh, Ali represents a generation of young critical thinkers and scholars that, to me, is the best that has happened over the last 30 years or so, uh, in terms of both their moral character and their political stance and their uh, exemplary scholarship. It is also very important for me to be part of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Rosa Luxemburg has had a towering presence 
uh, in uh, my intellectual and political uh, life uh, over the last, I don't know, maybe 50 years or so. So for me to be in Berlin, in the city of Rosa Luxemburg, and in an institute named after him is, uh, is a rare and uh, extraordinary privilege. I'm very happy and grateful uh, to Mr. Schulz and to uh, Charlotte Tenawi, his colleague, for facilitating my coming here. The more we age, the more finicky we become in our travels, and I'm very grateful that they accommodated my finickiness. What is finickiness in German? Uh, I just want to know. Translators put it rightly, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I was uh, asked to talk about the question of uh, this rapprochement uh, between Iran and 5 plus 1, uh, by which time Europeans, the Japanese, and, uh, and so forth were already traveling to Iran for lucrative business deals, uh, as they must, as they should, uh, is perfectly fine. Uh, and peace was, uh, was the issue. We were fresh in New York, coming out of a period that, as you, you remember, soon after the July 14th deal in Vienna, uh, the, uh, the US uh, uh, House of Congress and so forth, we call it occupied territory, uh, quote unquote, uh, they were determined to uh, torpedo the deal. So many of us were obviously for the deal, for the lifting of the sanctions against the war. And uh, especially for people like me, I'm a persona non grata in, in Iran, I can't go to Iran. Uh, they don't like me, I don't like them. Uh, the feeling is mutual. And the question is not that I'm afraid they may do something to me, the, the question is I'm afraid I still have things to say about them uh, that I don't want to compromise. Uh, but nevertheless, we are against war, we are against sanctions. Iran is a population of 18 million human beings. And uh, these economic sanctions, crippling economic sanctions, airplanes were falling one after uh, the other because of the lack of uh, technical uh, 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 spare parts. People in need of medicine were in, in jeopardy. And uh, so forth and so on. I mean, in the, uh, uh, Iranian students in, in European and Japanese and other universities were in trouble. They couldn't get uh, their uh, money from, from their parents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but fortunately, that succeeded. The Vienna talks were successful. 14th of uh, July, the Bastille Day, as it were, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the, the question for us was peace. At least there is no more war. War, uh, Iraq war on one side, the Afghan war on the other side. And as they used to say in, in uh, Washington DC, they said, well, everybody wants to go to, uh, to Baghdad, but the real men want to go to Tehran. So the threat of war uh, against Iran was always very paramount. And at least temporarily that threat was lifted and a prospect of possible peace, or at least suspension of hostilities uh, with Iran was paramount on all our minds when Ali asked me to come and give a talk here. So I was immediately reminded of uh, Rosa Luxemburg's absolutely magnificent essay, 1911, Peace Utopias. But just by virtue of realities around us, I throw in a war interval. Peace Utopias and uh, war intervals. Now, what does Rosa Luxemburg talk about? There's a short essay, it's available online. She says that there is a fundamental difference between peace for bourgeoisie and peace for socialist uh, uh, Democrats. And the difference is between the structural violence that she detects in the uh, uh, order of the world and the fact that peace without addressing fundamental structural violence that is, is, exists in social injustice is useless. And this comes from Rosa Luxemburg's absolutely extraordinary critique of Marxism. In her work, he, she, in fact, could be considered the father of colonialist studies, mother, as it were, uh, and uh, of post-colonialist studies. Because her position, critique of Marx, is when Marx anticipated the rise of a socialist revolution in Europe, she says the reason that Marx was wrong in her anticipation of the war, uh, revolution in, uh, in Europe 
is that Marx underestimated the uh, globalization of the capital and the significance of colonial uh, uh, domains in the operation of the capital that even her contemporary Marx Weber, Marx Weber called capitalism predatory, uh, uh, imperialism predatory capitalism. Towards the end of the essay, she in fact talks about, in 1911, about the prospect of the unification of Europe. Apparently then there was also a question of unification of Europe back in 1911. And she warns her uh, comrades that every time Europe talks about unification, it is a subterfuge for imperialism. And she mentions a specifically yellow uh, uh, peril, referring to uh, China, the Far East, and uh, the dark continent, referring to uh, Africa, and structural racism. This is her uh, phrase. And today, the substitution of Islamophobia for precisely the same thing that you see it in your own uh, city, in your own country, so far as the Syrian refugees, etc., are concerned, is a verification and testimony to an absolutely extraordinary insight back, to, uh, back in 1911. Then closer that was to my time to come to Berlin, uh, the Paris horror uh, uh, happened, the Paris mass murder of, uh, in Paris. And when that happened, and before it, of course, in Beirut, and before it in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, was, okay, now we were talking about peace when I told Ali, yes, I'm going to talk, but now after Paris, how could we talk about peace? And this morning I get up in the morning and a Russian uh, airplane has been shot down over, uh, over uh, Turkey, Turkey slash Syria. There's a dispute over the narrative. Uh, and before it, of course, you had the downing of a Russian airliner, etc. So, uh, in other words, we are living in a torpedo of events that are happening, a succession of events. And especially with these horrid gadgets we carry, this I iPhone, uh, and we're all, uh, you know, used to it. I'm sure some of you are surfing right now, uh, uh, answering your, uh, updating your status or something. Uh, the rapidity of these events that are happening, the speed with which they happen, and the speed with which we want to uh, respond, uh, requires kind of a saccharine instant explanation of what exactly is happening. And that is an added technological change that has happened to the time of Rosa Luxemburg. What, Rosa Luxemburg got in the morning in, the, in Berlin and reached for her newspaper and read it, and that was it until the following day for another newspaper. But this today is not right. I mean, I'm sure in the course of this hour or so conversation, something horrific is going to happen somewhere. I don't know where. So what we have, in my opinion, is battle of narrative. Constantly we are in the battle of narrative, and recently, when something happens in Afghanistan, the same crim criminal thugs called ISIS, Daesh, whatever uh, uh, we call them, if it happens in Afghanistan, you say, oh, these are Hazara, Shi'is. And many of you may have never even heard of Hazara, whoever is Hazara. If it happens in Beirut, oh, it's in Dahia neighborhood, the Shi'i neighborhood in, uh, in Lebanon. But if it happens in Paris, as President Obama said, this is an assault on humanity. And as I said in a recent piece, of course this is an assault in, in, on humanity when it happens in Paris, but also when it happens in Beirut, but also when it happens in Afghanistan, anywhere else. I know that all of you Iranians now are thinking of that famous form of Saudi, but just keep it to yourself. Uh, so the question is, where do we uh, start the story? And right now, the knee-jerk reaction is to start the story with the, what, the U.S. invasion of uh, Afghanistan, with the U.S. invasion of, uh, of Iraq, with the events of 9-11, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in each one of them that you start, there is a certain element of insight that you begin if you start the narrative from 9-11, if you start the narrative from uh, uh, October 7. 
Now, all of you know uh, 9-11, but I uh, probably don't know 10-7. I mean, it's the 7 of uh, October uh, 2001, which is the US-led invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, or March 20th, 2003, the US-led invasion of, uh, of Iraq. You can start any one of these narratives legitimately with certain insights and certain blindness, blindness and insights, they just go together. But for our purpose, because our conversation is about Iran, I actually like to provide a narrative that we should begin the narrative with the Iranian Revolution of 1977-1979. And my, my argument tonight with you is to simply suggest that uh, for us to begin in the, uh, uh, with the Iranian Revolution of 1977-1979 provides us with an alternative which I would like to uh, offer for our, uh, your consideration, uh, namely a kind of a reading that is no, that begins with the, with the, within the boundaries of the post-colonial nation state, but doesn't remain limited to the boundaries of the post-colonial nation state, and begins to incorporate the narrative has to incorporate the geopolitics of the region. Uh, now, when we begin to talk about the Iranian Revolution of 1977-79, we already have another three dates. Where do we begin? Okay, one point of departure is, of course, the uh, CIA-sponsored coup of 1953. That's a, perhaps the most traumatic event of Iranian history in the 20th century. I remember when. Uh, I was writing a book on the iconography of the revolution with my colleague uh, uh, Peter Cherkovsky. Every time, uh, as we say in Persian calendar, Bisash to Murda, Bisash to Murda, 28th of uh, Murda. And then... Uh, 19th of August. 19th of August, 1953, thank you. Uh, every time we came to that date, I had a knee-jerk reaction. When the CIA did the coup? When the CIA did the coup? The CIA coup of and finally, Peter told me, OK, we had it. We have it like 15 places in the book. It's enough. It's a, it's a trauma. It's a trauma that, and in the way that the Iranian mind works, of course, is the CIA coup of 1953, the Arab invasion of the Qadisiyya battle, and Alexander the Great uh, invasion. Iranians have this bizarre historical thing. They're exactly the opposite of American mind. You have to bang the heads together. Uh, so Alexander the Great, Battle of Qadisiyya, and CIA coup of 1953. This is the uh, this is the way our mind works. Alternatively, you can start with the uh, June 1963, the first Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, attempt at uh, toppling the Pahlavi regime. Uh, our calendar, uh, June 1963, which gives uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, CIA coup gives you an anti-colonial nationalist narrative, a perfectly legitimate, it can give you any number of good insights into the unfolding of the revolution. June 1963 uh, commencement gives you an Islamist perspective. And uh, then the third narrative is, of course, the uh, Siah Khal incident, a group of uh, guerrilla revolutionary activists in a small village in northern Iran, Siah Khal, which uh, we consider to be a particularly significant traumatic moment in the history of Iranian left, and gives you a Marxist, Leninist, leftist uh, angle on the, on the revolution. In my book that Ali mentioned, I say that uh, historically, as a scholars, we don't have to take, these are three ideological positions. Historically, you have to put them as three lenses together in order to see the unfolding of the Iran Revolution of 77, 79. In fact, the three ideologies, the th three forces, were actually present in the course of 77, 79. Uh, the argument that I put forward is at the time of the revolution, when the revolution was happening, if somebody were to do a detailed day-to-day -day study of 77-79, uh, in fact, the Goethe Institute at Tehran has a very significant role to, uh, to play. Usually, the Islamist narrative begins with a certain article that was published against Ayatollah Khomeini 
uh, in, a, in a governmental magazine that uh, soon there was a demonstration against that article that they considered to be insulting and uh, people were shot at and then in memory of those people, some other people that demonstrated and that's the narrative that is offered as the commencement of the revolution. But in fact, the 10 nights of poetry in, in Persian, we just know them as Dahshab, 10 nights, at the Goethe Institute in which gathered the most celebrated Iranian poets, novelists, intellectuals, uh, scholars, etc. And it was not just poetry, people were also giving talks, uh, etc. is exceptionally important. Saeed Sultanpur, a prominent uh, poet, had just been released from jail and he was at this gathering. And uh, this, fortunately, we have corroborating evidence. Anthony. Uh, Parkins, the British ambassador to Iran, r actually writes in his book about these 10 nights that you know, happened prior to that article. So battle of narrative actually begins uh, right there and then. In July 1979, uh, uh, nine, uh, it was 1978, uh, uh, when uh, I, w I was a graduate student at, uh, at Penn, I went to Iran. And uh, this is the, the summer that the category, the article of Velayat e Faqih, this notorious uh, theocratic element, had not been yet introduced in the, in the constitution that Hassan Habibi had drafted. That, year, that month of July was, ex is just was uh, uh, the spring of revolution, as we, we call it. Everybody was out discussing, debating, attacking, criticizing. And in fact, I participated on the site of Tehran University in a number of critical discussions, item by item, going over the, uh, the Constitution that uh, had just been the draft of the Constitution. And it is during that summer that Ayatollah Khomeini gave a talk and said, no Arab Zadeh with toxicated intellectual is going to write our, our Constitution. And it is during that summer that uh, uh, Shah, uh, heroic uh, Iranian intellectual uh, Mustafa Rahimi wrote a memorable essay, Chera Ba Jumhuri Islami Mukhalifam, Why I Disagree with an Islamic Republic, uh, in which he praises Ayatollah Khomeini as the leader of the revolution, but he lays out his argument why Islamic Republic he, uh, he opposes. Uh, the point being that between uh, February of that year and in November of that year, uh, we have a period that all the forces, the anti-colonial nationalists, third world socialists, and the Islamists are present and active and debating and doing all sorts of things. In uh, November of that year, as you know, the hostages were taken. For 444 days, as you know, the attention of the world was drawn to 70, 50 odd American uh, uh, diplomats that, who were kept captive in the, in the US embassy. These 444 days are exceptionally important days for the consolidation of the Islamic Republic. The first, the memorandum yes or no to Islamic Republic happens in this period. The first uh, presidential election that uh, Mr. Bani Sadr is elected is happens during uh, this period. And uh, the systematic again, uh, attack against the left begins to also happen during these 444 days. Under the umbrella, you know, uh, fighting against the great Satan and imperialism and so forth. And it is also during this period the most catastrophic split in the Mujahid, in the Cherikai Fadai Khalq movement happens into Aksariyat and Aghaliyat. Uh, before the American hostage crisis is over in January 1981, when uh, Reagan was about to inaugurate, of course, the pre preceding 81, the preceding uh, September, the Iran Iraq war had started, 1980. Uh, 1980 to 1988, for eight years, you had a devastating war between two mostly Shi'i, mostly Islamic countries. Of course, Saddam Hussein 
initiated the uh, the revolution, but uh, the attack, but Ayatollah Khomeini continued it for his own purposes. This is where the narrative has to go out of Iran and begin to see the regional appeal of the Iranian revolution by virtue of the fact that it was a cosmopolitan emancipatory revolution with wide ranging appeal throughout the, enti the entirety of the Arab uh, world into North Africa, into Central Asia. The commencement of Iran-Iraq war, in my uh, uh, opinion, as I have argued repeatedly, is the first bumper zone that the Reagan administration created to, to prevent the spread of Iranian revolution into the Arab world. Saddam Hussein was encouraged by uh, Reagan administration, was uh, armed by both the French and, and the Americans, and Saddam Hussein initiated the war against Iran. So for eight years, the Iranian revolution was being prevented, for the, the original cosmopolitan multifaceted Iranian revolution was being prevented to spread into the larger Arab world. What was the rhetoric of Saddam Hussein? That this is the second Qadisiyah. Uh, you know, great Egyptian filmmaker, uh, where was recruited to, to make a ghastly propaganda film for uh, Saddam Hussein called Radesiya. And as soon as the rhetoric of Arab nationalism emerged and anti-Persian uh, uh, rhetoric began to emerge from, from uh, Iraq, suddenly Iranian revolution became ethnic Persian. Because that was Arab, then this was Persian. So this persified a cosmopolitan. I mean, I will show you, I have documented, collected posters that Iranian student activists were collecting and, and throughout Europe, throughout North America, in which they write Persian Gulf because their colleagues were Arabs, Arab Gulf with no issue. They had no Iranian uh, ethnic bourgeois nationalism that ha this has to be called. Any revolutionary movement anywhere civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, any uh, progressive movement in Europe, any progressive movement in the Arab world, the Palestinian uh, struggles, Iranian students were part of it. 50s and 60s is the most glorious cosmopolitan part of the Iranian left. And there are documents that you can see it. With this invasion, suddenly a revolution that was embedded in that cosmopolitan revolutionary disposition became persified. These are Persians, we are Arabs. Simultaneously, on the other side, Reagan CIA engineered, Saudi Arabia financed with Wahhabi uh, ideology, Pakistani intelligence created what? The Taliban. Now, who were the Taliban? The Taliban were created for two simultaneous purposes. Number one, to kick the Soviets out of Afghanistan, and number one, to create another bumper zone against the uh, Iranian revolution, and it's a spread into Central Asia. Now, by virtue of the Wahhabi disposition of the ideology of uh, 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 the Taliban, Suddenly, the Iranian revolution became a Shi'i revolution. Because that was Sunni, this is Shi'i now. So you see, until you begin to have an analysis of the Iran-Iraq war as an Arab-Persian thing, and the rise of Taliban, and the prevention of the spread of the uh, appeal of the Iranian revolution into Central Asia, into a Shi'i-Sunni thing, so these two geostrategic elements come together to degenerate the Iranian revolution into a Persian Shi'i revolution. And of course, the ruling clergy loved it. Of course, it's a Shi'i revolution. And they began systematically to write a history for the revolution that uh, systematically and, and consistently dispersed. They didn't like Mossadegh, they didn't like the left, they didn't like any indication. If, if you were, in fact, to the, to the constitutional uh, revolution, the same thing by virtue of the uh, European educated and globally conscious 
uh, Iranian intellectuals involved in the Constitutional Revolution, including the significance of Berlin, in fact, in the rising of uh, uh, magazines, journals like Kove, uh, at the time of the Constitutional Revolution. Uh, so, the two monsters that the US and its European and regional allies helped to create in order to prevent the spread of the real I Iranian revolution, its multifaceted aspects, Saddam Hussein on one side, Taliban on the other side, succeeded. And Iranian re re revolution degenerated into a theocracy. Internally now, we have a number of successive movements uh, that begins with the mass execution of Iranian political prisoners. I must here say the presence of my dear, dear friend, Mafarid Mansouryan in the audience, as one of those members of the left who, was, who endured the horrors of the uh, dungeons of the Islamic Republic and saw the execution of her comrades. And I also like to express my utter gratitude to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for uh, the providing uh, uh, Mafarid Mansouryan with a home for her to, get, to finish her uh, dissertation. I won't point to her because she gets embarrassed and then fight with me. Mass executions in jail, university purges, successive cultural revolutions begin, continue, in a manner that now is corroborated by the geopolitics of the region, systematically transforming uh, the revolution. But the two monsters that the US and its European and regional allies had created, namely Saddam Hussein and the Taliban, now came to bite back their creators. The ink on the Iran-Iraq peace treaty was not dried yet that Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990, with the same armament that US and its European allies had, had given to him. And soon after that, uh, the Soviets were kicked out. Taliban slash Al-Ghaida was created in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. You had the first attempt at the World Trade Center in 1993. And you had the first attack against US uh, consulate in Dar es Salaam. And the first time that people actually began to hear about Al-Qaeda and, and so forth. Prior to that, uh, President Reagan had brought members of the Taliban to the White House, pointed to them and said, these are the functional equivalents of our founding fathers. Pictures of it are internet. You can, you can see those pictures. So, the uh, first Gulf War, as we call it, hmm? Uh, begins with the same armament that the U.S. had given to Saddam Hussein, occupation, bless you. Uh, uh, but Bush the father, as you know, we have a dynasty, Bush the first, Bush the second, is just like a... Uh, Bush the first had the wisdom of not going all the way to Baghdad, just kicking Saddam Hussein out of uh, Kuwait, and allowing for the uh, status quo to remain. This is not what happens with the second uh, Iraq invasion after the events of 9-11. You see, I, what I have done, I have opened the window for us not to begin with 9-11. Of course, 9-11 was a horrid, as a New Yorker, I'll, I'll tell you, was the horrid, traumatic experience it was for New Yorkers, of course. But who, the first attempt at World Trade Center was not in 2001, it was actually in, in 1993 by the same creatures who finally succeeded in doing it in 2001. From where? From Afghanistan, where they were, they were trained in Afghanistan. Who trained them? Zbigniew Brzezinski is now a very revolutionary liberal. But the, 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 the first command for jihad in 20th century was what Zbigniew Brzezinski, as they were mobilizing the Taliban in Afghanistan. So, if you begin to the, the narrative with the Iranian revolution and see the manner in which this revolution was appealing to the region at large and the creation of the Taliban and Saddam Hussein on the two sides of it to prevent its, its spread, you have a whole different perspective of what happened a couple of weeks ago in Paris. Because 
you have the, uh, the creation of, uh, of Al-Qaeda, as it were, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. It spills into uh, Iraq in the aftermath of the March 20th, 2003 US-led invasion. And now we can shift to the events that we know as uh, uh, Arab Spring. Now, Arab Spring, you can of course have traces of it in the Green Movement in Iran, as I said, uh, soon after the Green Movement began in uh, June 2009, that the same demographic composition that you see in Iran, you see it in the Arab world. And there is no reason that this thing can happen in Iran and not, not happen in the Arab world, and it immediately happen in the, in the Arab world. Of course, no two political cultures are identical. Even within the Arab world, there is a difference between Bahrain and Yemen, or Yemen and Syria, and Syria and Egypt. There are, of course, differences. But the youthful disposition of these uprisings and the fact that their slogans were fundamentally different slogans. What was the, the, the slogan of, uh, of the Green Movement? It was not death to this and long live that. The, 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 the slogan of the uh, Green Movement was a rhetorical question. Where is my vote? Finish. There was no death to this or long live that, nothing. Where is my vote? But it's a rhetorical question. doesn't have an answer. And the fact that the, the election was rigged was a social fact. So now there are, uh, I mean, dear friends, uh, distinguished demographers that do a study, oh, we ask this question from uh, uh, this number of sample in this number of population that they all believe, no, the election was not rigged. Where's my pillow? This is not the question. The, the fact is that in the course of June 2009, that the thing was rigged was a social fact and people pulled massively into the streets to ask this rhetorical, unanswerable question, where is my vote? I mean, Khomeini couldn't reach into his pocket and say, oh, here's your vote. It's a rhetorical question, doesn't have an answer. It's a fundamental question which is only a civil society can ask, and no political, no state can answer it. And what was the slogan of the Arab revolutions? Number one, Ashab Yurid Asqat Nizam. People demand the overthrow of the regime. But this regime is not just, uh, what should we call it, Hosni uh, Mubarak uh, uh, or uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. The regime is a, is a loaded word. Nizam is a loaded word. And what was the other uh, slogan? Hurriya, uh, freedom. Adal uh, Ishtimaiya, or Ektimaiya, as the Egyptians say, social justice. Uh, bread. There's no death to America, there's no long live, you know, anything. These, the, the problem with, uh, with Iraq was that Iraq, by virtue of the US-led invasion of 2003, was denied the dignity of their own uprising against their own tyrant. What did you have because of uh, the lies of uh, Ahmad Chalabi? You had the debasification. You did, had a complete destruction of the state apparatus in Iraq. And you had this massive uh, number of the former Ba'ath parties pouring into, uh, uh, into the, with no future, no job, their families, etc. And they are the ones who are not aid, aiding and abetting, in fact, integral to Daesh. The reason for the military success is that the former military officers of the uh, Ba'ath Party are not part of this. Otherwise, a gang of uh, Chechens and uh, European kids bored with their life or whatever else might be the cause, they are not capable of this horror that is being perpetrated by Daesh. And of course, the, 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 the other thorny issue is, is Syria. Now, here in Syria, whatever you say, if you don't have a regional and global perspective on Syria, you fall into a, a debate with uh, one group or another. Syrians joined the revolution with one slogan, Salme, Salme, peace, peace. Who bloodied it first? Bashar al-Assad. Now, if after that, 
the CIA and the Saudis and the Qataris and uh, the Israelis and so forth, they go and start arming and creating uh, armed resistance. That's a subsequent issue. Now, if you talk about uh, Bashar al-Assad's criminal record of, of slaughtering his own people, I say, oh, so you are pro-Saudi or pro-Qatari. If you begin to criticize Saudi and Arabi, uh, uh, Qataris and uh, Americans and so forth, oh, so, so, you, so you are okay with Bashar al-Assad? No. What sane people, person could be okay with any one of them? But for you to have a, uh, a uh, you know, I always use the metaphor of when you go for your eyeglasses, to ophthalmologist, they keep putting multiple lenses, picking it up, ring, you know? Multiple lenses until you have 2020. But if you just put one freaking lens and say, well, that's it, well, you can't see properly. You have to have the agency of you as a critical thinker to have multiple lenses with no loyalty to either of these parties. The only loyalty that you have is to Syrian people or to Iranian people, or to Iraqi people, or to uh, Parisians, or to whoever who is a vi victim of uh, uh, these horrid acts. But suddenly an ethnic nationalism emerges. So when I am against sanctions, against the war, he's well, an agent of Islamic Republic. Two weeks later, I write a, an article critical of Iran for not accepting Syrian refugees. Oh, he is, he is with Saudi Arabia. And my poor wife says, if you work for both of them, how come uh, we have to f live from one paycheck to another paycheck? <laughs> but I'm in good company <laughs> with Ali. Uh, so between these two revolutionary moments, 77-79, and 2009-2011, these two revolutionary movements, I propose we have major epistemic shift in our history in terms of how to understand our societies. By society, I mean to propose a fundamental conceptual decoupling of nation from state. The coupling of nation and state is a colonial heritage we have received by virtue of European history. We have never examined it. And it is, this is what I'm telling you, is the subject of my new book coming out in, uh, soon. Iran Without Borders is going to freak out people. Iran Without Borders. In which, I pro uh, in which I propose the decoupling of the nation and the state. Because no state, not just Islamic Republic, uh, Pahlavi, Qajar, you, you go, they don't have a total claim over the nation. What did Khamenei say in the last presidential election when people were debating whether to go to vote for uh, Rouhani or not? Do you remember what he said? It's an extraordinary confession. He said, if you don't believe in Islamic Republic, you go, you believe in your country. So he confessed there is a difference between the nation and the state. Finish, halas. <laughs> and people actually went. Now, what happened in the course of the, of the last presidential election? Two things, extraordinary. Some voted and some didn't vote. Simple. Those who voted and got, quote unquote, because you don't trust these uh, uh, results, uh, Rouhani into office, they send a message to the outside world, no against sanctions, no against military uh, strikes. We take care of our own business. And those who didn't vote send a message to Khamenei, you can't kill Nidago Sultan, Sohraba Arabi, etc., and get away with it. So they send a two zigzag message to two different directions with perfect precision. The, the question is, how do you read it? Because people create, people created Musavi. Who was Musavi? Musavi was the prime minister of Khomeini, of uh, Khatami. Uh, we all start with Khe, Khomeini. Uh, he was the same prime minister, but suddenly, in the course of the Green Movement, they crafted, they gave birth to their ideals and aspirations. 
Otherwise, you know poor Musavi, he, I mean, he's neither charismatic, nor can he talk. Cheese, ask him, I mean, you have to watch his, his poor, I mean, his wife is infinitely more uh, eloquent in, in, her, uh, in her speech. But people crafted something out of him that they wanted. And the same was with, uh, with Rouhani. To make a long story short, because we want to open for a conversation. Why are you looking at me like that? No, it's OK. OK? <laughs> Just, yeah. Otherwise we start. Either I very impressed you or I bored you. I don't know which one it is. Uh, to make a long story short, because my, the question with which I propose the, uh, uh, the abstract is, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to open the window, open the frame of references, OK? And here, I'd like to conclude with two magnificent German thinkers that have been influential in my own thinking. One is Hannah Arendt, and one is Jürgen Habermas. In her book on revolution, Hannah Arendt provides the most magnificent interpretation of the phrase, pursuit of happiness, in the Declaration of Independence in uh, US uh, history. She says, pursuit of happiness is pursuit of public happiness. Namely, she makes a distinction between uh, liberation, liberty, and freedom. Liberty is from tyranny. Freedom is to participate in politics. And the domain of politics is the public sphere. That's where uh, uh, people find their happiness, by virtue of being in public. Now, this question of public sphere for uh, the uh, Habermas's magnificent book, uh, Structural Transformation of the uh, Bourgeois Public Sphere, is uh, s extremely significant as to the formation of public sphere, not public space, public sphere, Newspapers, uh, magazines, uh, internet, uh, etc. The only problem with, as many critical thinkers have uh, have written already on with Habermas, is that it is uh, limited to national and European. So we have extraordinary cr uh, critical expansion of uh, the bourgeois public sphere in transnational public sphere. The problem with that transnational public sphere is that we have to make a distinction between the formation of capital as the center of self-centering notion of the West and colonial as peripheralizing uh, the rest of the world. The two have to come theoretically, conceptually, thematically, and politically together for us to see the significance of an event in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan and in uh, uh, Lebanon and in Paris is structurally related. And the way that you see it is to find a conceptual link between the crisis of migration that you see happening, Syrian, Afghans, Iranians coming to Europe, and the Eurozone crisis. The thing that nobody talks about, I just came here from Doha. There are many Germans in Doha. There are many French, there are many English who go the other way. The, uh, the Portuguese prime minister told the young Portuguese, go find job in Angola and Brazil, former colonies. So the structural issue, this goes back to uh, the issue that Rosa Luxemburg recognized, the structural deficiency in the global operation of capital is global is not just the Syrians who are coming. Suspend for a second this Islamophobic, racist assumption that you look at a Syrian and you think, oh, one passport was uh, uh, found on, on some Syrian, oh, they are coming to blow us up. The Syrian immigrant in particular, they are identical in terms of their education, in terms of uh, they have been planning this for months, the, following their GPS and so forth, which directions to go. It is the most educated in a, con in, a, in, a continent, in a continent that you have a history of educated migration from World War II uh, and before and after that. 
a recent migration into, uh, into Europe. That has to do, uh, there was a moment that the term refugee and the term migrant began to uh, transfuse because you have had a structural transformation of the need of the labor for capital and capital for labor. And the way it works, we have it also in the United States. You have labor migrants coming north in search of capital, right? Capital dodges, goes, and finds a, a factory in Guatemala. Okay, so most of the, uh, the problem of Islamophobia that you see in Europe is that the population is aging, it needs uh, young labor, they need the labor, but they don't like the laborer. And they say, no, you can't have a minara going up. Well, they have it sideways. Uh, the same is, has to do with, in the, in the American context, in the US context, you have some uh, gung-ho racist uh, member of the Congress that says, no more Mexican immigrants. Who is going to pick up the uh, strawberries and the potatoes and the tomatoes? So if you follow the news, actually, it's complete political nonsense that people like uh, uh, Trump and et cetera are talking about because the, the, the market needs the labor, but cheap labor, undocumented labor, because they can't unionize. They can't scream and kick. You, so you keep them under the uh, minimum wage, and they have no resort to anything. So going back to the question of uh, rapprochement, the rapprochement is happening. Iran is a huge market. And uh, uh, tomorrow I'm giving a talk at another uh, institution, and they were concerned that I may say something that may compromise German financiers. Uh, it, will ha it is beyond the control. The, qu the key question is, how do we read? We need alternative critical narratives. Alternative critical narratives that go beyond the national borders that begin to, ex to expand the European uh, continent into its Mediterranean context and begin to incorporate Europe. Unless and until Europe begins to feel the pain of people in Lebanon and in Syria and in Africa and, and, and so forth, and, uh, and sustains this notion of purity, that this is something uh, uh, absolutely different from others, it will never begin to think creatively and critically outside the box of, oh, these uh, uh, Arabs and Muslims are coming to pollute and dilute our, uh, our society. Boundaries have to come down. Narratives have to become more complicated, complicated by virtue of incorporating events that are on the surface not related. You need to have a global vision. You need to have, uh, uh, i give you two statistics and i stop. Every night, according to UN, 850 million human beings go to bed hungry. The guy from Princeton who just got uh, the Nobel Prize in economics, some British economist, I forget his name, you know what's his claim to fame? That he has come with a cockamamie calculation of redefining poverty, so that 850 million has come down to 730 million. Oh, it's okay, 730 million is fine. Compare that figure with the military budget of the United States between 2000 and 2008. It was number 33 with 11 zeros in front of it. I have no idea how to say that number. And I don't think any decent human being should say that number. So I always say 33 with 11 zeros, whatever is that number. This is where the issue is a systematic militarization systematic militarization of the state. You have the militarization of the police force. Look at Ferguson, look at Baltimore. Where do these weapons come from? These weapons come from Pentagon creating them, but they don't have enough uh, Arabs and uh, others to kill, so they give them to the police. Militarization of the police force, systematic over-militarization of the state, transformation of the state into a uh, garrison state, okay? And look at Iran, the post Iran is just like an octopus, has all its uh, tentacles into, uh, into the uh, rest of the society. Look at the military budget of Saudi Arabia, it's obscene. Saudi Arabia at the head of a 10 Arab nation coalition. 
10 Arab coalition from Morocco to Jordan, bombing the poorest country in the Arab world, Yemen. At the time that the uh, Israelis uh, soldiers are on the Qubbat al-Sakhra, on uh, the thing. Of course they will do it. Who is going to, what, with what moral authority? Who is going to resist it? So there is a lot that has to be done in terms of systematic militarization of the state. I mean, are you kidding? And then human rights. I, I, I promise this is the last thing. Human rights. Look at the last month. CC comes to London, huh? the, the, the guy who did the military coup in Egypt, and, and somebody, uh, you, you watch BBC, oh yes, CC is a pillar of stability in the region and protects our, uh, our interests. However, human rights, okay. He goes, the Chinese president, Xi comes. Oh yes, he's coming with a huge economic packet to build a nuclear thing in, in uh, oh yes, she, uh, yes, this economic, he, he gets a dinner with the queen and uh, uh, this and that. Uh, however, the human rights in, in, uh, in China. Who comes next? The, oh, Modi the, uh, the, from India comes. Oh yeah, song and dance, uh, Modi is a huge economic interest. It's, uh, however, human, oh yeah, this. Uh, Islam and the Hindu fundamentalism. Every head of state who comes to think, and then the human rights. What human rights? Is a complete sham. It doesn't exist. Please remember that Alan Dershowitz, who is a distinguished professor of law at Harvard University, argued for the precise way in which needles have to be sterilized before they're used to torture people. Not despite the legal system, of which he is a great professor, through the legal system. Michael Ignatieff, head of the Human Rights uh, Institute at Harvard University, wrote a book called The Lesser Evil. He too argues for the necessity, the, the so-called theory of ticking bomb, of the justification of torture. Not despite the human rights discourse, he is the freaking head of the Human Rights Institute at Harvard University, through the human rights discourse. So, human rights in idea, as an, as an idea, as a concept, uh, who am I to say Amnesty International or uh, Human Rights Watch or etc. They should not kick and scream when somebody is being abused. Of course they should kick and scream. But we need to rethink whether or not we actually have human rights. Habeas corpus, the fact that I'm innocent until I am proven guilty, thrown out of the window with the Patriot Act in the US. I have no doubt one more horrid terrorist act in the US, all of us will be rounded up and, and put in internment the way that the Japanese were put into internment. Look at the manner in which the internment of the Japanese during World War II is being re-justified by new writings that, oh yeah, well, we was for their own protection. Uh, going back to the Egyptian slogan of Ashabi Rida Scott and Nizam, that Nizam, that regime, is, as I have argued in my book on the Arab Revolution, is a regime de savoir, is a regime of knowledge. We need to rethink critically these old cliches and ideas. Uh, that, and this, uh, we are tired of keep pointing to hypocrisy of uh, UK. So we, so, UK helps Saudi Arabia to become the head of the Human Rights Forum at the UN. Would you as a human, decent human being would be able to use the term human rights after that? They do more beheadings than Daesh does. As somebody wrote an article, Saudi Arabia is a successful Daesh. But who talk, um, then we are not, we are not Daesh, we are not Saudi Arabia, we are not uh, Bush or uh, uh, Obama administration. Right now, if you look at the face of uh, American uh, uh, presidential election, except for Bernie Sanders, but I don't think Bernie Sanders has a, has a chance. As I always say, he's a dollar too short, a day too late for, uh, for that society. So then now we have the bourgeois feminism, we need the first woman president, okay. Margaret Thatcher was also a woman. Uh, 
uh, there is, as we say, intersectionality. Unless you bring gender and race and class together and look at them simultaneously, uh, you end up with Margaret Thatcher. Thank you for your patience. Um, so, I'm coming back to the subtitle of today's uh, discussion, which is what is our task in the times of rapprochement with Iran? And as you know, a lot of people are concerned that during this process of rapprochement, the human rights issue, which has really deteriorated over the last two years, uh, will not be uh, on the agenda. And it will be completely ignored, like the cases that you mentioned with, uh, you know, with the various regimes in the region and traveling to Europe. So what are the pillars that you think uh, you know, citizens, civil society, and intellectuals should uh, look at uh, as we go forward in this process of rapprochement? Uh, Trans-regional solidarity, as that young lady was just saying uh, in her comment, trans-regional solidarity, but not vacuous solidarity, structural solidarity, labor union with labor union, writers associations with writers associations, women's rights organizations with women's rights organizations, student assemblies with the student assemblies. So recognize the transnational disposition of public sphere, articulate the formation of the uh, uh, transnational public sphere in terms of enduring institutions that protects the individual. So if Amir Hassan Chihil Times has a novel that cannot be translated in, uh, it cannot be published in Iran, there are possibilities of publishing it in Germany, but making it av available also to, uh, to Iranians. The same is with, uh, with other issues. So stop thinking of the fetishized, uh, nationalized, ethnic, uh, nationalism, which runs into the question of uh, uh, Persian superiority and so forth. Recognize the multifaceted aspect of all post-colonial nation formations, namely multiple nations that have been. Begin to theorize the formation of the national consciousness by virtue of collective struggles that historically uh, we have made. Don't be disappointed by these repressive, horrid regimes. They are not injured. They are not representative. They have a claim to representation, but they don't represent. Nations are liberated from the state, nation state. That's my, my simple proposition, which I articulate in the book. And there is no, the fact of the matter is over the last two hours, this is Iran. Yes, I speak in, in English, but <laughs> Uh, you could be, this talk could be in German, could be in, in Persian, could be, we can't have it. I can't have this conversation in Tehran. But the fact that we can have it in Berlin has to have a structural reverberation inside Iran as, as well. So there is no sense of uh, claustrophobia that, uh, that exists. Finally, you have to transcend this binary that you either have a repressive regime and that you have to endorse it Okay, or you have to have open arm for new liberal econo economics and all its horrors, and there is a no way of for you to articulate a critical position, oppose sanction, oppose war, but demand civil liberties for not in generic terms that people can uh, appropriate you, but in very specific uh, institutional terms. For me and my kind of thinking, labor union, women's rights organization, and, and the student assemblies. Without it, all the conversation, as great uh, Rosa Luxemburg said at the, uh, in that essay, is uh, bourgeois utopias. Bourgeois, let's all shake hands and go home and be happy, while there are structural violences that ha is happening in societies. Thank you so much, Professor Hamid Abashi. Thank you. Thank you.